welcome to System Shift, a Greenpeace podcast exploring new ideas and thinking for those who want to create a kinder economic system. Today, we are joined by Indy Johar, an architect and the co-founder of Dark Matter Laboratories, an organization dedicated to developing new support frameworks for collaborative system change. Indy is a visionary and thought leader in the field of architecture and design, with a passion for creating systems that work for people and the planet. He believes that the current economic system is driving the destruction of our planet and that we need a radical shift in the way we think about, design and implement our systems if we want to prevent this from happening. Through his work at Dark Matter Laboratories, he's pushing the boundaries of what is possible in the field of economic system change. He's leading a campaign to create more equitable, sustainable and regenerative economic system that puts people and the planet first. Dark Matter Laboratories is a field laboratory focused on radically redesigning the bureaucratic institutional infrastructure in our cities, regions and towns for a more democratic, distributed, great transition. And it's doing some of the most interesting work on rethinking economic relationships, value and monetary flows. In this work is a beacon of hope for those who believe that a better future is possible, that we can work together to create a world where economic systems serve people and the planet, not just the interest of a few. In this podcast, we'll be exploring in this work and the innovative approaches he's taking to create system change. We'll delve into the challenges he faces and the impact his work is having and exciting new projects in the pipeline. So, without further ado, a warm welcome to you, Indy. Delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for coming. And I think when I've been listening to what you've been saying at different conferences and so on, it's really this kind of transaction-based economy rather than having relations that is a key problem for when we allocate things incorrectly and where we don't see the consequences of things we do and things we do do have negative aspects. Is this something you would like to explain a little bit, the difference between a relational and transactional? Yeah, I mean, I, I think over the last sort of 400 years, we built a worldview and that worldview has been constructed around the idea of seeing separation between ourselves and the world around us and between each other. And that object-subject worldview, which actually has heralded the last 400 years of science in many ways, was built through this theory of separation. And whether it's classification theory, whether whether it's Cartesian logic, whether it's object-subject, whether even, I would argue even the birth of perspective was a theory of power and separation. Now, power and separation has allowed for transactions between separate things, but it's also allowed for violence between those separate things. And I think what's really the paradigmatic moment that we're living in is that separation, which perhaps was useful, perhaps created the landscape for this transition we're in the middle of, has also allowed for invisible violence and is also allowed for externalities. And those externalities and those feedbacks are now self-terminating us. And CO2 is just one, whether it's the largest bioextinction or the largest bioextinctions the planet has seen, it's also another aspect of this. So I think we're in this world view shift from kind of how we've separated ourselves and each other and understood the world through its separation to a re-emergence of the entanglement. And what we're seeing is the feedback cycles of our negative externalities are challenging our theory of how we relate, how we understand ourselves in the world and how we relate to the world. And in a way, property, the idea of property to own things is a foundational world view where you say humans have dominion over the world and we can optimize it to our needs without understanding the interdependencies of a piece of land with water systems, with uh, with ecological systems, with microbiomes, all sorts of things which can be discounted for the utility of us. And that utility of us is now self-terminating us because all these invisible things are actually massively harming us. So I think you're right to say there's a foundational transition going on in terms of how we relate to ourselves and how we understand ourselves as humans, but also how we relate to the world and how we understand the world through its entanglement. There are so many interesting aspects here in what you brought up. I mean, we have the separation from us and nature and this kind of dominance and control logic towards nature. We have this transactional view in, into human re- relations, which means that we have discrimination, control and violence, as you mentioned. And this permits, rather, the view of nature being exploited. Shall we go through a little bit about this? Because I don't know if you read the book uh, from Caroline Merchant, um, 
the death of nature, I think that was really interesting because she showed how during the thousands of years we have been civilization growing and so on, how the view on nature changed from like a life-giving Mother Earth to an evil stepmother holding its precious metals deep underground and, and, and how this transformation of philosophy towards nature changes. So that's the first aspect of this. And you mentioned the last 400 years, of course, this has escalated. What permitted us to do this change? Why did this change happen, you think? I think there was loads of things. One is kind of the, I think culturally we went through an age of, of understanding the world, that we were in dominion of the world, we were in control of the world. And I'm not even yet certain that this is good or bad. What I'm more interested in is that these are moments of civilizational development. And I think we're reaching the end of that civilizational development theory. And I think we're reaching a moment where that theory of control, that theory of dominion actually is self-harming us. And now we need to move to recognizing that perhaps we're li living in a new planetary singularity where human machine ecological systems, the planet itself is becoming conscious. So a new paradigm is approaching where we can start to see our entanglements not as a loss, but actually as a new profound capacity which has never existed before. So I, I'm obviously every age has had its associated disasters and associated sort of externalities and massive even huge violence. I also think we're reaching the end of that age and having to embrace a new way of being. And if we don't, I don't think we survive. You know, this. I think the, the fact is our current worldview is massively driving huge amounts of externalities and those externalities will self-terminate us either directly or indirectly. Radical kind of scarcities that we're about to see, whether it's in copper or timber or in sand, the fundamentals, forget the rare earths, it's the fundamentals will actually drive us to some form of geopolitical tensions and even war. So I think there's a really profound moment that we have to move through, which is actually to deal with scarcity with a new type of institutional logic and to deal with that scarcity as we reach a new theory of abundance over the next 40 years where maybe energy and materials do become super abundant again. But to do that, we have to actually change our worldview and go through a, a kind of a transformation moment change our worldview and our relationship to it. And I think that's now also possible at the intersection of our computational capabilities that are giving us the capacity to make this new bureaucratic worldview. Our worldview was constructed through an efficacy of bureaucracy and accounting. And now with, with computational capabilities, we can construct a new landscape of that reality. We can talk about, you know, how do you make rivers self-sovereign and put a point of view, which is not a human extracted point of view, but actually point of view which looks at a river and its relationship to the value it generates and spills over in really radical ways. So we can genuinely create a multi-agent worldview. We can actually computationally help support that uh, in that multi-agent point of view. So we can move from a theory of assets to a theory of agencies. And I think that's an extraordinary moment and it's gifted by us by some of the computational capacities that we are starting to unlock and have access to. But that's going to require a concerted effort and a deep transformation of our worldview it's not that we have relationships, we are relationships. And this is a fundamental transformation in who we are and thereby our relationship with the world. But that cascades into our institutional framework, that cascades into our worldview and how we construct it, and thereby also what we value and how we value it. I think it's interesting you mentioned these examples with the rivers, like for example, New Zealand or Costa Rica, where we have seen the start of nature's right logic into changing our view on nature. And what gives me hope is, as you mentioned in history, we had different problems. When you talk about scarcity and abundance, I mean, when these theories developed, the scarcity was our capacity to transform nature to things that made our lives easier. But now we are facing a new system limit. It's not our capacity that is limited anymore. It's nature's capacity to deal with all what we want to do with it. So earlier we changed our worldview when we needed it for development and now we should change the worldview again seeing our interdependency and and how nature put limits on what we can do and then also the view of nature should change so we realize the interdependency is that how we should interpret this yeah and i think these things are coming at us and i think they will transform not only nature-based things like rivers and other things but also our worldview of things like what happens if a house owns itself a theory of dominion isn't just about nature, it's also about the things around us. 
what happens to our relationship with things, which recognizes that a book is a knot of matter and information that exists for a moment and then bifurcates into other flows. So even a book is a flow of things. It's a sort of relationship of things, not a thing itself. So I think this worldview will manifest from the kind of rights of nature into our everyday world, everything around us. And that means we have a very different relationship with how we manifest with it. So I think this is a beginning of the story, but it's often discounted because we often talk about the climate transition in terms of decarbonization. Uh, but actually, carbon is merely a symptom of the problem. It's a symptom, not the problem itself. The fundamental problem is actually we're creating a world view, whether it's carbon or heavy metals, or we're, we're releasing vast amounts of pollutants into the system. And unless we change our worldview of how we relate to things, I think we don't we don't deal with it. And final point I'd say is also our nature with, with things has been driven through a theory of consumption, and largely that consumption theory has been based on, I would say, you know, since Henry T. Ford, and you know, has been based on almost dealing with the externalities of work itself. So if work is a mechanism of doing repeated work, then consumption is a point to almost deal with the tyrannies of work itself in different formats. And consumption has been like a, a, a dopamine response to the tyranny of work, where we suppressed ourselves and enslaved ourselves to simple actions. To allow for us to heal from that, we use consumption as a dopamine. It's, a, it's largely not for the thing itself, but it's the act of validation, the act of social validation. And I think unless we start to change our relationship with consumption, our relationship with work, we don't deeply go into solving what I think is the root causes of some of this stuff, that we are over-consuming and misconsuming. We're not consuming for value. We're consuming just to actually for the dopamine hits. And I think that's a key part of that story because we're going to have to reduce our nature of consumption or shift our consumption from materiality and relationship to things to immaterial landscapes. So I think this is a deep co-transformation, both of the nature of things, but also our nature of what we want things for, and then a dire relationship with things in a really fundamental way. And I think it's also nice that you mentioned this. We have an episode in this series with uh, Pickett and Wilkinson exactly about this, the comparative consumption rather than consumption for actually solving problems or, or dealing with things that could make our lives better. And uh, people who want to listen to the negative impacts of increased inequality can listen to the episode with Pickett and Wilkinson. When you talk about um, this consumerism and work as a problem, that's kind of interesting because every politician, I used to be one myself, has always said we must create work, but inherently most of our innovation has been targeting to work less hard. So how come this has been the dominant narrative of the political class to always promise more work, more jobs? So I think the problem is not more or less, but the nature of work itself. I mean, our theory of work has been built around a theory of command and control. Management is a theory of control orientated from the idea of military service. Our theory of production and mass manufacturing was born out of kind of military, military theories. I think what's really fundamental and question is that place the human as a bad robot. Most employment laws are largely an extinction of slavery, frankly. So I don't think we've rebuilt a work economy for the 21st century. A 21st century work economy isn't about extrinsic motivation. It isn't about extrinsic command and control. It's about building the capacity for intrinsic, self-authoring capacity of humans and ennobling humans to do the work that's required rather than controlling humans to do the work that's required. That's ironic, actually, because... When we talk about work, we always talk about paid labor. It's, we, we, we are not mentioning the things people do because they want to do it for its intrinsic value. And one experiment in Trondheim in, in Norway where they did this was they came with the idea that we need to have a more efficient public service there. It was too expensive. They couldn't afford to have the service the citizens needed without raising the taxes. So they made a deal with the labor unions that instead of having democracy perfectly and then nine o'clock in the morning you stop democracy and you have hierarchy and then five o'clock again you start democracy, they thought, why not introduce democracy at, at work? Why not have a cooperation mentality uh, rather than a dominance and control mentality at work? And this led to so many efficiency gains and also reduced sick leave and psychological ill health. So 
the whole reform was paid for by the better well-being of workers when they felt in control, when this dominance controlled slavery logic that you mentioned was not there anymore. And this is the revolution of work as necessary for, I think, the 21st century. I think humans are going to have to be developing in a really radical different way to unlock that capacity, capacity for care, capacity for embodied intelligence, capacity for complex cognition. That's going to require an intrinsic motivation. And I think that's going to require new forms of foundational capabilities that require a new theory of work in the 21st century. And I think the problem is most politicians are still caught up in a 19th century theory of work, not recognizing we've moved into a new theory of value. And this theory of value will actually shift our theory of consumption because we're no longer seeking dopamine hits in a false format to deal with the tyranny of work in itself. So this is a deep part of the change theory that's absolutely critical. And it also starts to thereby change our theory with the nature of things, the nature of how we relate to the world, because it's fundamental for that transition. And that fits rather well into happiness research, that um, people who feel control and empowered at workspace, they tend to feel much better and be much better, be happier people. So changing this, what work is and how it should be designed uh, would actually make us happier. But how do we get from the current narrative where everything is related to consumption power into what kind of transformatory steps would you see would help us to go from the current logic to the future one? So I think there's multiple aspects for this. I, I think, so if you have a can of Coke and an orange or a sustainable apple, let's say, our current economy is geared towards a can of Coke because the can of Coke is cheaper, it's addictive, it externalizes all its costs, whereas the sustainable apple internalizes costs are more expensive and effectively is non-addictive. So what you have is a current optimization of our economy to allocate capital to the production and consumption of Coke. Now I use that as a metaphor, that our current economy is geared towards production of cans of Coke. If we want to shift it to look at not just the unit cost of a can of Coke, but the system cost of a can of Coke, which is you know, the sugar impacts, diabetes, um, the CO2 releases, uh, transportation costs, X, Y, Z. An exploitation of uh, underpaid people in the global south. Absolutely. And then you compare that to an apple. Well, we know the apple is much cheaper for society as a whole. So the question that really comes to the table is the first thing we have to do is re-gear our economy to understand the system level costs, not just the unit level costs. And I think that's a really critical part of the story. Second, I think we have to change the nature of work itself and actually create the kind of, you know, the Nordic revolution, you could be argued, is based on the box schools, people schools, which are all about building self-authoring capacity. They weren't about skills, they were about skills and philosophy coming together to actually build the self-authoring capacity of citizens. But I think we have to rebuild the self-authoring capacity rather than the instrumentalization of citizens. So we have to rebuild the self-authoring capacity of citizens in the new war. I think then we have to sort of recognize that our economy is going to face fundamental shifts in terms of materiality. So, for example, we don't have the materials to build new homes in Northern Europe. We don't have the carbon budgets to build the new homes, right? We don't actually have the carbon budget. So what does spatial justice mean when we don't have the capacity to build new homes because we don't have the carbon budgets, we don't have the materiality in our cities, we can't afford to release more CO2 at the air. So what, how do we share uh, the materiality. How do we stop material, material hoarding actually reducing capacity of society? So what does that innovation look like? How do we rebuild and rejuvenate our ecological system? How do we build an economics that understands the agency of things around us and the world around us? So this to me is a deep code transition. It's also our nature of things moving away from theories of ownership, but not from ownership to rental, but looking at our self-sovereignty of a world of agency rather than assets, which means that recognizing everything as an agent of the pass through of kind of materiality and flows to it. That means that we operate in a relationship of care with things, not in a relationship of consumption and destruction. I would say this is a structural transition as big as the industrial revolution. And, and yet we're trying to see it as a tinkering edge of the industrial revolution. This is a transformative revolution of everything around us. Our food systems will change, our energy systems will change, our material systems will change. Every one of these things will, will evolve. And I think what we haven't really done is started to understand that scale of transition. We need to construct a new politics around this, a new discourse around this. This is about deeply a new ennobling reality of humanity. We have to move from beyond a theory of control to a theory of ennobling. 
and we have to embrace that management as a theory of orchestration is no longer fit for purpose in a complex emergent world. And that requires learning to be at the center of orchestration rather than control. And that requires CEOs to not be chief executive officers, but chief learning officers. And we have to build new theories of risk. That means that risk is handled by those at the closest capacity to innovate rather than at the center point of this organization. So this is a foundational transition. This is actually not really new. I studied at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And when those buildings were built, Sweden's most famous sculpture was assigned to decorate them. And they did art history and philosophy in the beginning, not to become engineers disconnected from other values. And that thinking was there already, but all those educations are now kicked out and new houses are built without this kind of thought in it. And this fits very well into the neoliberal production logic we see dominant now. So I think this narrative of bringing back this logic that people cannot be you know, only expert in one single field disconnected from everything else, that's not going to work. I think we have to talk about polymathic capabilities. So our society has created silos yeah. of learning, but actually all innovations are virtually always at the intersection of disciplines. So how do you build societies which encourage polymathic capabilities and the intersectional uh, capabilities across disciplines? And that has to be an intentional act, uh, and as opposed to being dividing us into ever and smaller and smaller disciplines with no capacity to interrelate and build the complex realities of the whole. Yeah, and it's also much more interesting to see the context of what you're interested in in other contexts, because then you will learn more, you will see more applications for what you're thinking about. So I think it also will help us create more freedom of thought and development. So another thing when I listened to you now was the concept of what freedom is. I think that has been distorted. Do you agree? Absolutely. As we've seen it, freedom has become a method of escape. So we've created a system with a system of control. And then what we do is we say freedom is your theory of escape from that system of control. So if you accumulate enough wealth, you are free to escape that system. So we've kind of created freedom as a theory, as a something, a carrot we dangle in a system which is entirely about the tyranny of control. And, and that's been the incentive system. And we've created languages around freedom, but actually we need to think about freedom as an inherent quality of the system, not the quality that is outside the system. So what would happen if you would talk about freedom, not as a theory of escape, but the freedom to care, the freedom to be present, the freedom to engage, the freedom to be deeply human. I think those are the deep freedoms that we need to expand. And I think in a complex entangled world, actually it is a freedom to care that allows us to relationship with each other. And that requires us to be embodied humans with new capacities. So I think we have to intentionally re-grasp words like freedom and give them new purpose because I think they've become a systematically problematic right now. We need to re-grasp them and re-embody them in a, in a world of entanglement, what does freedom really mean? Freedom means to be embodied, to be in relationship, and to be in true relationship and operate in a theory of care. And freedom in that reality is a mutual freedom, freedom of mutualities, as opposed to discrete freedoms of escape. That's really interesting narrative now, because I mean, in many ways, the modern individualistic, capitalist, consumeristic society, when you mention care, people think about burdens and duties rather than as a liberating factor for realizing true freedom. So I think that's interesting. How would you then help people following the logic of the research, the proven, the proven theory of that care, relationships, interdependency actually liberate us more, gives us more happiness, gives us better life quality? How would you argue to do this mental internal change so we can reset the goals to something that actually benefits us and the planet rather than destroying both of us? I don't think this is some moral moment. I mean, I think this is the moment of how we discover value. And this is the other thing that we often argue this from a kind of moral case. And I would say that in an age of complexity and emergence, care is the modality of operation, which is critical. And innovation is going to be discovered through these intentional capacities to care. And we're going to have to democratize the capacity to innovate at vast scale society. So for me, this is not a moral case. It is the new economic case. And it is a new economic case of operating in a machine enabled society and an entangled ecological society, which we have to create a new operating 
procedure and protocols for dealing with our complex American entanglements. And I think so, I, I'm less and less kind of convinced that we should be making a moral case, but actually a new kind of uh, new logical case to say this is how we need to operate and this is how value will be discovered in the 21st century. And almost certainly, our theories of control no longer can control. Our theories of control can no longer manage the externalities which are self-terminating us. Our theories of uh, command and control no longer actually can deal with the risks that are being created in businesses. So it's very clear that our theory of control no longer becomes efficacy or possible in an entangled, complex, emergent landscape. And that, I think, is means that we're at the end of a cycle of a way of organizing to a new way of organizing. And this new way of organizing has a new economy to it, a new theory of value to it, and a new behavior. Like you know, in the industrial age, we were taught to go to schools to allow us to be programmed to become predictable, to go to nine to three o'clock schools. That was all about giving us predictability, building, uh, building new capabilities that I think we have to build new capabilities for a new society and a new economy that recognizes we've moved beyond theories of control. I mean, both of us actually argue for there is scientific evidence, there is logic that would promote this change. But when we speak about this new way of having an economy built, what kind of structures would need to change? What decisions, what laws would need to change? Not only the mindset, what changes could we do to laws and practices that would help people with this mind shift? I think we're starting to see some of them already. I think changing our relationship with nature, the right to nature stuff is a really good beginning. I think we have to invest in human development. And I think the inner development goals and the work that's going on there with people like Thomas Bjorkman and other people, I think that's a key part of the story. We have to build a new 21st century self-authoring capacity of citizens. So investing in the human development becomes really critical because I think it unlocks us from the tyranny of malconsumption in different formats, which is actually really critical. Uh, you know, sweet, the average Swede consumes 27 tons of matter a year. The global average is two tons. So we have to massively reduce our material input in the world. I think we're going to have to change our food systems. We're going to have to drive actually uh, a new new food economy, which is going to look the soil not as an infinite exhaustible asset, but actually see it as an ecological infrastructure, which has to be renewed and has to be sustained in different ways. So salt putting the soil at the base root of our food systems becomes really critical and reinventing our accounting frameworks for that. Off the back of that, actually, we have to reimagine the kind of contribution of food. Then we have to transform our theories of understanding our built environments. Like our built environment is a kind of a massive landscape of violence in many ways, whether it's indoor air quality is five times worse than outdoor air quality, or whether it's actually noise pollution and the impacts of noise pollution certainly in big cities actually has, if you live on a busy road in a, in a busy city, actually you can lose two to three years of your life just with actually stress levels of the noise during night actually means that you end up with higher levels of cortisol, which makes you more susceptible to diabetes and uh, chronic issues. So we have to reimagine, our, understand our theory of violence and reimagine and rescope our theory of violence and understand the impact it has on the human development. I think then we have to also start to really radically talk about building an intangible uh, sort of economy. And what does that look like for the 21st century, whether it's virtual, but it's also about new forms of human capabilities. So I think this is a fundamental transition that starts with and multiple of these dimensions. What I find fascinating is that the people get this. When you talk about this conversation on the ground with people, people intrinsically know the problem. When you talk about the can of Coke and the uh, sustainable orange, they understand this problem. And we have to talk about actually how we build a new politics and a political conversation around this. And this isn't about left or right in my worldview. This is about actually understanding a new reality that's emerging and how we operationalize ourselves into a new reality. We have to re-empower ourselves to actually think big. I think we've become at the edge of market tinkerers thinking there's no other thing we could do. So how do we build the capacity to think big and act big as a civilization, recognizing we're in a moment which is almost as big as the enlightenment, where enlightenment and the entanglement comes together to create a new worldview. And we have to give ourselves the freedom to reimagine that. And maybe to help people start thinking big, sometimes it's good to start thinking from the local perspective and draw conclusions. Uh, when you talked about the soil, let's go back to the food, because maybe that could be an easy way to exemplify what you mean. So there is this old 14th century law in one county in Sweden where the value of the inheritance was decided upon by the thickness of the fertile soil. So if you actually increase the thickness of the fertile soil, then you have been successful. And if you decrease it, you have been unsuccessful. So like 
this is not often shown when you talk about value of farm today or for food like a tomato that is full of pesticides and full of carbon emissions and full of human suffering on the global market you wouldn't see the difference between that tomato and one that has the opposite so how would you help people in their daily lives now go for the right tomato so to speak go for the right soil treatment methods what what steps can you equip a person with who who see what you t- say but how do you help them acting on it but i think this is where your inheritance conversation is absolutely right so i would actually say this is a policy problem not a consumer problem i think we should be measuring the thickness of the soil at the point of actually every sale and saying has it increased the thickness or has it decreased it? If it decreased it, we'll tax the sale very heavily. And if it's not, we'll tax it to actually then put into a sinking pot to support the rejuvenation of that soil. This doesn't have to be centralized taxation. You can look at put sinking funds in on land, which means that if the soil becomes degraded, those sinking funds demand at the point of trade actually take a greater portion, which means that the soil could be rejuvenated. So I think we have to build new fiscal mechanisms and accounting mechanisms actually value the right things. Currently, we're not seeing soil as a life form of which we live. And we're seeing it as an infinite resource, like a machine that will run in perpetuity. And we're consuming it. We're destroying it. We're undermining it. We're destroying the nutrition quality of the food we're getting. So I don't think this is a consumer problem. I think it's actually our freedom to actually create, reimagine that inheritance law for the 21st century. That's the innovation. Yeah, so even if it's not the consumer problem here, the solution, one of the solutions she came up with now was, for example, taxing. And I agree on that, uh, having more logical social and and um, ecological taxes and climate taxes and so on would help us to steer the economy in the right direction. But you talked about before was also this monetarization of everything. We need also the system shift in the mind of that not everything can be valued. Even even if you try to integrate all the complexities, it's still going to be difficult to do that either centrally or locally with taxes and economic regulation. So here, my question is again a little bit, uh, how do we help people having this mind shift of, of not everything is transactionable, tradable in an economic measurable way? So f- from my perspective, I think this is an and conversation. We're in the middle of a a form of cultural revolution, a revolution of how we imagine ourselves. Like Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man was a birthplace of a cultural revolution because it sort of understood, isolated man from nature, it made it platonic, um, and it understood it in a dissected, separated way. So I think there's a kind of interesting moment where we have to have the cultural revolution happening as well as the accounting revolution happening. Mm. And these things are symbiotic. And so it's not one or the other, but I think it's the and. So yes, we have to work on reimagining ourselves and our relationship with the world. Then we have to reimagine our relationship with governance with things in terms of our stewardship responsibilities, so rights and responsibilities with things. So we, it's not an asymmetric world. And then we also have to be able to build the fiscal and the kind of accounting norms to be able to reinforce those realities. And I think we have to see it from those dimensions working together. And we, as you mentioned already, we have different tools to do this. We have, well, you can act as a consumer, you can act as a community, you can act as a municipality, you can act as a nation state, you can act at the European level, at the global level, within or outside of the business world. Everybody has an agency here where they can start acting. If you would recommend to European politicians a route and a venue, a lawmaking that they could do to help this transition, what recommendations would you give them? At this moment in time, I would start with the nature-based systems. I think looking at actually how we govern the rivers across Europe and the water supply of Europe will be a critical thing. And I think we're going to see big strategic issues with water systems across Europe, both with the summer coming, but also with actually glaciers becoming very fragile and in the Alps and other frameworks. So I think the water systems story is a really critical one. I do think politicians need to be having more honest conversations about the material realities we're facing. Not to be defeatist, like I don't think we can afford to build any new herbs across Europe if we're taking our national carbon budget seriously. But then it opens up a real important conversation, which is to say, how do we then provide spatial justice, a justice of space across Europe in the 21st century when we don't have that? 
So I would start encouraging politicians to link up to the science and what the science is trying to say to us and the severity of it and start to have a new political discourse. And I think we need to start to have new forms of public conversations to be able to unlock that. I think it's interesting that you mentioned water. I was in the European Parliament when this uh, Water Framework Directive was negotiated yep. about 15 years ago. And um, the estimation we did then was that restoring water quality to the standards we set would cost around 2,000 billion euros all across Europe, including the UK at the time. So the, yet again, in the beginning of our discussion, we talked about what gets monetary value and what gets excluded. Here is again showing that we had a false economic efficiency on all this water exploitation. Very much so. And the implications of that in terms of our health, but also in terms of our fragilities, is going to be significant. So I totally agree with you. I think this is these are false economies that don't understand actually the long-term liabilities that we're holding in a substantive way. Let's be visionary for a moment there. Let's say we are successful with this. Let's say we change the view on nature, our relationship with nature, our relationship with each other. We get rid of the old colonialist dominance logic and we have this as the outset. How would the daily life look like? How would our relations look like if this is the basis for our interactions and economy? I mean, it's a great question. And I suppose my, my first answer to this is I resist this question because I think this should be the imagination of everyone rather than the imagination of you and I. I think this is a pathway to a new way of being, a new way of becoming in the world. And I think the transformation is not just in in ourselves, uh, not ju just as a sort of an idea of what the world looks like, but it's a new way of how we manifest in the world, how we exist in the world. And that to me is profound in, the, in, in a deeper sense. I mean, I totally agree with you. I don't believe in a constant fixed utopia. It's pointless to have that because every utopia yeah. is a counter reaction to what you perceive as a problem today. And, and of course, this is a co-development procedure, but still people like visions and dreams uh, and sometimes they need help to visualize it. Look, I think we're in the middle of a 40 year journey and a 40 year journey where we'll go through systemic scarcity over the next 20, 30 years, where if we get this right and rebuild a new capacity and a new relationship with our planet and the world around us, we will unlock huge new abundances, whether it's energy or materiality, but also with new cognitive abundances, new intelligences about our individual intelligence, but our relational intelligence. Mm. This conversation is only a possible because you and I are having this conversation. It's not a function of my brilliance or your brilliance alone. It's a function of our relationship. And I think we have to start to see the world through a different set of values. So for me, if we can unlock this journey and we can avoid you know, mutually assured destruction and adopt mutually assured renewal, I think we can unlock vast, extraordinary capability that we've not even just begun to imagine. So I think everything will change around us and how we relate to it will change fundamentally. I'm actually happy you kind of avoided to answer my question because you did it even better than I hoped for because what you actually did now is like inviting everybody to this co-creative process of imagining it and then delivering it on this. So that's probably the best answer you could have given anyway. It, it is and I, and I intentionally do that and I don't apologize for that because I, I sometimes find it worrying that I think the beauty of tomorrow needs to be discovered by everyone and everyone mm. needs to be on the journey of their becoming. It can't be opposed by you or me and any description that I have will be insufficient to what is possible. And that's just not me being humble, but I just think, think it's not just possible. And I think some of us are just the scaffolders, the bridge builders to a world that I think is beyond our imagination right now. And that's okay. I think let's admit it's beyond our imagination, but I can tell you for certain that these these fundamental shifts of moving from theories of control to theories of learning to new theories of relationship with the world will transform everything around us, everything, including how we exist in the world and with each other. And that's an extraordinary moment. We also mentioned a little about the externalities and how do you define externalities and how can we reduce the impact on them? Yeah, I mean, because it's one of those simple words, but actually, you know, you're right to ask the question because let's go back to the can of Coke. The can of Coke is designed, you know, when the aluminium was dug out, there was ecological damage done, which was not 
typically priced. The carbon effects or the kind of biodiversity losses, not priced really. Uh, if you then look at actually the CO2 that was released from the hydrocarbons that did dug the bauxite out the land, actually that was probably not priced in terms of the CO2 damage. We know that one ton of CO2, if you did a true cost analysis, could be something in the region of 27,000 uh, euros if you did true cost damage in terms of the global world. So when you start to look at that, that, that was not priced. Uh, the damage to the water systems in terms of extraction, the mobility costs of, of moving those cans of coke or those cans of soda around the country, both CO2 release that unpriced the system. Uh, if you looked at the addiction value of actually caffeine and its effects on addiction and sugar levels uh, and the healthcare cost unpriced the system. So where's the can of coke you can buy for 99 cents? Actually, all those other costs are unpriced. And the problem is all those micro costs are actually now self-terminating us, whether it's the cost of our healthcare system or it's the cost of CO2 damage and climate change damage, or it's the cost of the ecological diversity losses that we're seeing. Now, every can of Coke is a micro contributor, but when you imagine everything is doing that, virtually every chocolate bar you buy, every food that you buy, every white good that you buy, it's externalizing those costs. Those externalities are now accumulating to such order that they're driving large scale losses, whether it's our health, whether it's climate change, whether it's biodiversity. And we're in the middle of the sixth largest extinction the planet has ever seen. So it, these are extraordinary effects generated by micro behaviors on a planetary scale. And the problem in history was we could largely ignore this. We were relatively small pre-1970s. Our impacts were relatively small to the planet. Since the 1970s, our impacts have been vast relative to the planet. Those externalities are now feeding back into us and driving the damage. But when you talk about system change, most of the talk we have today is about other aspects than the purely financial or, or economical. But what do you see as the fundamental flaws of the financial system? I mean, at a fundamental level, I would say it's the centralized production of money is a real part of the problem because it also creates a centralized theory of value and thereby creates a centralized theory of where portfolios of value are understood. Um, I think that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is that I think we're living in a world where that risk that I was talking about is unpriced in the system. So we've got risks which are unpriced. As a result of them being not priced, there is no provisions made for those risks on balance sheet, and thereby there's no investment possible to be able to manage those risks. Third, I think our public, uh, you know, we, we are building its usual decision-making capacity. So for example, there is, I don't know of any company that's running a carbon treasury function on its balance sheet. I don't know any local authority that's running or municipality that's running a carbon treasury function. So how do you build a carbon treasury to look at those and what carbons? We are running material balance sheets of our places. So looking at materials that we own and the liabilities and the value of those things over time. So our incentives are misgeared. So I, I think all of our risk is fractured into individual discrete actors. We have a preference to be able to financially hedge those risks as opposed to naturally hedge those risks aggregatively. So how do you create pooling capacities around those risk frameworks? So I think from a monetary level, I think there's a whole bunch of questions that we don't have the capacity, or aren't investing in building the capacity for large-scale quasi-infrastructure level projects, whether it's water systems renewal, river systems renewal, uh, whether it's tree canopies of cities or the collective intelligence of a city. So we, we're not investing in the next generation assets of the 21st century. We don't have the asset codes for that reality. Uh, we don't have the more public balance sheets in the right way. So I think there's a structural reform required of the kind of financial landscape in order for capital to flow more effectively. And it goes at every one of those levels. So deep financial reform is going to be absolutely necessary to be able to drive this reality. And even if you do that, we still, even if you successfully would have a proper accounting of uh, carbon and tier one, two and three emissions, i.e. the whole value chain of your production, still you would not account for biodiversity impact and social impacts uh, nationally and globally. So you really need to set the whole financial framework in a new setting then. Exactly. And I... I think that's going to come at us through crisis more than anything else, as the fundamentals start to become more and more fragile and vulnerable. The Industrial Revolution was driven by bills of exchange. Bills of exchange were distributed money formations, and distributed money formation allows for value to be understood at a local level rather than centralized level. 
So I think we're going to see radical new technologies about uh, for our theory of money that are emerging. And Bitcoin is just a poem of the future. It's a sort of a practice trend. I think we're in the middle of a new transformation. At the same time, you've got central bank currencies, digital currencies coming to bay, which actually could be very powerfully undermining of democratic capacities of societies. So we, we are in the middle of a war between the massive centralization, the command and control economies, and how do you build new forms of democratic money formation, which I think is really critical if you're going to rebuild and hold on to democratic societies and actually distributed forms of value, which is really essential in the complex emerging world. So I think these things are all on the table and they're at the monetary level as well as the risk level than every other kind of stage I've spoken about earlier. Yeah, and also, I mean, you mentioned Bitcoin. We have another episode in this podcast here with Adam Pettifor, and, and she was really worried about the energy impact and other negative aspects of, of cryptocurrencies. But if I if I may enlarge your concept of alternative currencies, there are currencies that are within their own construction providing public good, like the, the Lishu in Lisbon, which is created only if people actually do material recycling in a better way, or... The, the Colorado dollar uh, where you have okay. the, the where you have the construction of social value in the money creation process so if we talk more about those it will be less you know conflict about them and I think we're going to see kind of tradable you know water rights tokens and so quasi money becoming more and more real yeah and especially if it could be dynamically benched against a universal currency it becomes equally tradable so I think there's a, there's all sorts of innovations that are going to come to the table that are essentially a key part of it as we can actually distribute and decentralize the provenance of those mechanisms and the trustability of those mechanisms. That's a key part of the innovation landscape. Well, thank you so much, Indy, for having this discussion today. And um, I really hope that people feel inspired and seeing their own possibilities for agency and dreaming and having a vision of the future that they could, you know, get energy from. So thanks a lot for this. No, it's an absolute pleasure. And thank you for everything that you're doing. I think it's really important that we have these sort of conversations and start to chart actually the deep transformations that are required. Because I think this is this is a one in a 400 year transition. It's not a transition of kind of like, you know, since the 1970s. This is a deep structural transformation of our relationship with the world. And I think we need to start to have these conversations. This is cultural, it's institutional, it's our theory of value. All of these things are being transformed. And at the other side of that, I think it's a really extraordinary future for humanity at a planetary level. And I think that's an extraordinary moment. And so thank you very much for hosting this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friends.